So this is our, our final talk, but not our final part of the conference. So David Gagnon is going to give us a critique of skeptical reason. Take, take it away, David. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. So just to say briefly, this was a chapter that would have entered my dissertation work, but I decided it doesn't fit so well. So this is me finding use for it. So uh, philosophical perspectives to conspiracy theories can be roughly ca categorized into three broad camps. As Dr. Dentith classifies them, they are uh, that conspiracy theories are prima facie false, that they are prima facie false, but there is, um, or they are not necessarily prima facie false, but there is something about them that is suspicious and they should be approached reluctantly, or they are neither prima facie false nor suspicious on their own. So this essay explores each of these approaches attending to the scholars of each camp and their diverging perspectives to reveal the antinomies implicit to their conflicting perspectives, signaling that none can lay claim to superiority over any of the others in their own terms. So upon presenting these approaches, I turned my attention to a fundamental similarity among them. That is, they're hinging the validity of conspiracy theories upon their potential veracity. What this does, I argue, is foreclose an engagement of a conspiracy theory qua conspiracy theory or uh, that might reveal what someone like Bradditch identifies as major social and political issues defining US and global political culture. So I put forward in a very butcherish way, uh, a critique of skeptical reason to supplant it with what I call borrowing from Immanuel Kant, transcendental conspiracy theory research. Now transcendental conspiracy theory research is not concerned with the truth of the conspiracy theory, Rather, it is concerned with the conspiracy theory in terms of those who espouse or deny it and its effective dimension, accepting that the conspiracy theory has, in Kant's words, about, not about conspiracy theories, of course, uh, but as he writes, outside our thoughts, no existence grounded in itself. So this presentation defines skepticism or uses uh, the term borrowing from Richard Popkin as the effort to determine, in his words, not what to do or what must people believe, but rather what evidence is there for beliefs and is this evidence act adequate? Now I align the conspiracy theory scholars here presented with this form of skepticism because they each emphasize the conspiracy theories veracity as a prerequisite for it's being taken uh, you know, seriously. There might be empirical truth behind it. So here into the first camp that conspiracy theories are prima facie false. So this camp of conspiracy theory research just focuses on the harms of conspiracy theories pretty um, generally uh, on and, and the harms that they inflict on dominant and legitimating modes of knowledge production. So big names in this field, and I, I just present a few here, but there are others. So Sunstein and Vermeule, uh, of course, uh, Kassam, and, and the list could go on. Now, they belong to this camp of conspiracy theory research for a number of reasons, given that they, in the case of Sunstein and Vermeule, view it as a what they call, uh, regrettably, a crippled epistemology that stems from sharply limited number of relevant informational sources. Now, Sunstein and Vermeule nuance their project, however, you know, to lend uh, some credence to it in Olive Branch, suggesting that they are only interested in what they call false conspiracy theories, not true ones which is a tenuous qualification, of course, because a conspiracy theory once accepted as true is no longer, you know, a conspiracy theory, you know, conspiracy fact, whatever silly term you want to throw in there. Uh, and what is more, this bifurcation between legitimate and illegitimate types of conspiracy theorizing forgets that every single recognized conspiracy began as a conspiracy theory. Uh, of course, the Watergate conspiracy was only accepted as true when it was proven to be true. Before that moment, it was no less true. Um, as per their positivistic and empiricist bifurcation of truth and falsity, it was it was merely not accepted. Now, Sunstein and Vermeule assume a decidedly drastic approach to combating conspiracy theories. They propose, in their words, and we're all familiar with this, that the government can partially circumvent these problems of debunking conspiracy theories if it enlists credible independent experts in the effort to rebut these theories. Um, now, Ole Bjerg responds by accurately pointing out that Sunstein and Vermeule are essentially proposing that the government should, in their words, the government should do precisely what conspiracy theorists are claiming that the government is doing. Now, the irony of this proposal overshadows its present plea to combat the conspiracy theory. Now, while there are a few others who share this drastic stance to essentially uh, put in government agents to crush conspiracy theory belief, there are many who 
similarly hold that there must be a direct intervention by legitimate authority figures to combat conspiracy theories by supplanting them with um, voracious data. And that puts us into camp two, which just going briefly through them, uh, that is that conspiracy theories are not prima facie false, but there is something about such theories that make them suspicious. Uh, now, this camp of conspiracy theory research asserts that conspiracy theories are not prima facie false, but there's something about them that makes them suspicious. And this position attempts to assess the conspiracy theories to some extent in their own terms. Now, if there are facts that might accompany it, uh, they might be heard. But the point is that uh, despite the conspiracy theory maybe not being disavowed outright, there's still going to be a general air of suspicion about them. They aren't going to be assumed to be any kind of um, legitimate form of explanation in, in any way, shape, or form. Now, in an effort to maintain a uh, kind of equilibrium between humility and critical skepticism, for example, Brian L. Keeley puts forward the distinction between conspiracy theories and unwarranted conspiracy theories. Now, as its name might suggest, unwarranted conspiracy theories are devoid of uh, some of the hallmarks of legitim legitimation, be they evidence, reason, what have you. And they should therefore be disavowed on the grounds that they lack the proper uh, the proper evidential basis for their acceptance. Now, this does not mean that he is completely generous with conspiracy theories. Uh, for him, they, in his words, embody a thoroughly outdated worldview. Um, now, this separation is difficult to accept because it obviates the problem that any uh, warranted conspiracy theory must have begun as unwarranted, very similarly to what I said earlier about um, the first camp or Sunstein and Vermeule. Now, this is a problem that intensifies when we ponder if Keeley is only interested in those conspiracies that have been proven to be true, which is an ironic criterion given the propensity of conspiracies to remain obscure. Conspirators aren't very interested in having their plots laid out and, and revealed. Now, this point is confirmed by Steve Clark, for example, when he states that none of Keeley's arguments against unwarranted conspiracy theories establish that unwarranted conspiracy theories are sign significantly less epistemically reputable than, than other social theories. Now, given such a point, um, it would appear as though he would be more comfortably nestled, or Keeley would be more comfortably nestled within the first group of conspiracy theory research, but he does, however, concede that conspiracy theories are are not necessarily wrong because small groups of powerful individuals do occasionally seek to affect the course of history. Now into the third camp, that is the camp um, that can also be um, more shortened into the particularist camp, that conspiracy theories are neither prima facie false nor typically suspicious. That is, they are uh, a way by which to explain events in that should be listened to, legitimated, and assessed on the basis of their evidential merit. Now, history is rife with conspiracies. Lee Basham, for example, suggests as much when he observes that the, in his words, um, the genocide against indigenous North and South Americans, the Jewish Holocaust, the Stalinist record show trials, and many others began with a conspiracy. Now, conspiracies are present social phenomena and have been necessary for uh, many of the most atrocious acts in, in history to take place. And there is thus some credence and suspicion of any authority for if they act maliciously or ignorantly, the outcome might have devastating consequences. A Basham in, in another essay provides an extension of the sentiment when um, Basham writes that the background suspicion of most conspiracy theorists is that public institutions are and perhaps always have been largely untrustworthy. Conspiracy, conspiracies are ubiquitous and their ubiquity makes their theorization a necessary component for a functioning liberal democracy. Now, this approach does not necessarily imply that all conspiracy theories, no matter how extreme, are a priori true. Conspiracy theories are approached instead as vessels for possible truth and should always be considered seriously and earnestly as a result. Now, this camp of inquiry differs from the previous ones in that it embraces um, a, a kind of skepticism about power and is therefore prepared to entertain any possible explanation of an event or broad social political economic phenomenon, not just leaving it up to um, government agencies or academic institutions to tell uh, the people what um, they're allowed to believe in terms of events or, or phenomena. Now, the, the scholars within these three camps uh, diverge drastically, like there's no, there's no reason to clump them into one neat category, obviously. Uh, but all their approaches gravitate around one crucial privilege possibility, and that that is the conspiracy theory might be true. 
So the first camp recognizes that conspiracies have occurred and can occur, but a conspiracy theory should not be recognized as a valid explanation of any event. Uh, and they are just should be, uh, unless they're proven, uh, they shouldn't be entertained. The second camp concedes, concedes that conspiracies are common phenomena and that therefore conspiracy theory is worthy uh, of attendance for the possibility that may be correct. And the third camp posits the absolute necessity to avow conspiracy theories for conspiracies are ubiquitous social phenomena. Now, while these approaches are insightful and of limitless value in conspiracy theory research, they all anticipate the end of the conspiracy uh, theory with either it's being proven true or pro uh, proven false or proven true. Uh, and we, we get this in other thinkers as well, of course, uh, Dr. Dentith, who supplied the foundation for our, uh, gave us these three camps, or at least uh, taxonomized them in that way, uh, has also argued uh, in their words that uh, a reluctance to deal with examples of warranted conspiracy theories skews the academic debate on the rationality of belief in conspiracy theories. And so there is just, uh, as, we, as we hear in many of these camps, there's just an outright disavowal of conspiracy theories as uh, a possible explanatory mechanism for uh, certain events. And my, my own interest in this to just um, stray off the path for a moment um, is interested in the ways in which some knowledge is get construed, of course, as conspiracy theories very much in the same vein as uh, Bradich employing certain Foucauldian strands of thought. And I, I think about, for example, out of, um, out of madness and civilization when Foucault is describing the, um, the mental patient who describes how he is made of glass. And Foucault meditates on this to say that, well, the person who says that they are made of glass and claims that if they fall off a building or something, that they will be shattered um, is not utilizing um, incorrect logical reasoning or uh, fallacious logical reasoning. In fact, they are very much being uh, sequential in their in their reasoning. They say, I made a glass. If I fall off a building, I'm going to shatter. And their bones will shatter, of course. Uh, so there is a kind of rationale there. And the, the thing is that Foucault is really highlighting is questioning to some degree how some forms of knowledge, even though there is this effort to describe them as being epistemically uh, fallacious, utilize many of the same methods, many of the same uh, strategies employed by so-called reputable ones. So he's really showing that the line is not quite so neat between uh, the methods employed by one, uh, one institution versus maybe someone considered to be a social pariah or somebody uh, struggling with mental illness and, and so on. So the squabbles between these broad camps, and I'm, you know, I'm drawing very much from uh, David Cody's edited volume, which I'm sure we've, many of us have read. Uh, and it's really a fascinating book because it almost, it also almost realizes the thing that it's describing, you know, engaging in this open discussion between thinkers almost in real time. And it's, it's, it's fun for, in, that, in that way. Now, the squabbles presented in this text in the, between these three camps reveal what I call uh, an antinomy of conspiracy theory research. Now, I say that because it is impossible necessarily to quantify the validity of any conspiracy theory. Perhaps the task should be to assess the conspiracy theory in itself as a causal explanation that may or may or may not affect people. That is to look at the conspiracy theory as something that can be recognized as, ex as existing, at least a existing within uh, human perception, we can recognize conspiracy theories, even if we don't have uh, the evidence to prove that the thing it's pointing to, the conspiracy, is true. Now, this is not to justify the belief of conspiracy theories, per se. Rather, it is instead to call, uh, it is a call to avow the conspiracy theory as a point of departure for a fruitful engagement of its effects and affects. Now, here I want to consider this in terms of phenomenology, uh, really, with the work of Immanuel Kant in a um, very force forcing way, uh, because I just like Kant, and I think that I, I, I felt the urge to put uh, him in dialogue with conspiracy theory research for some reason. Now, to begin to construct this method, let us consider uh, that is a method of transcendental conspiracy theory research 
Let us consider perhaps uh, counterintuitively the philosophical critique that Immanuel Kant mounts in his first critique. Now in this text, Kant turns his analytical gaze, analytic gaze for metaphysics, questions concerning the existence of God, for example, to the very mechanisms necessary to make this gaze possible, sensibility, intuition, uh, understanding, experience. And he reduces all knowledge of the world to these operations to some extent, suggesting that it is impossible to completely dissociate oneself from one's experience is one's um, existence in, in a world that you uh, engage with through your, through your senses, of course. Now, any attempt to dissociate oneself from experience is destined to be misguided, for it will fail to recognize that all concepts derive from experience. Consequently, metaphysics, very much like the conspiracy theory research just presented, is, in Kant's words, so far from reaching unanimity, unanimity in the assertions of its adherence that it is rather a battlefield, and indeed one that appears to be especially determined for testing one's powers in mock combat. Metaphysics cannot tell us anything about the world because it attempts to bracket off the world a priori. All metaphysical debates then only resolve themselves in what he calls a dialectical illusion where neither side can, like, can claim victory over the other. For example, in considering the antinomies of pure reason, Kant presents the thesis that space and time are uh, finite and the antithesis that space and time are infinite, including other uh, antinomies that he identifies, of course. Now, in arguing both of these possibilities, he arrives at the conclusion that we as human beings are devoid of a transcend transcendent frame of reference to validate either of these claims. And so both are either held to be uh, true or either held to be false. One cannot overcome the other. Now, Kant, of course, does not reserve this polemic for uh, those engaged in the debates of metaphysics. Now, when considering the nature of objects in the world, he dissuades any attempt to uncover that the thing in itself, uh, what is called the noumenon, which is because the world and anything in it is only perceived by human beings through our medi mediating uh, our senses. Um, and the object is never perceived by a perceiving being in the same way that the object exists in itself. Uh, and it never really, as, as in the case of humans, we never appear to ourselves or experience ourselves in the way that we are as uh, noumena, of course. Now, perceiving beings, as perceiving beings, humans only ever engage with sense data of an object, not the thing in itself or the noumenon. Now, in his words, he says we can have uh, cognition of no object as a thing in itself, but only insofar as it is an object of sensible intuition. Now, all thought begins with experience for Kant. Of course, this experience is what constitutes higher order faculties like understanding or cognition, which portend pure reason. It supplies the foundation for this thing called pure reason that very much or very often, at least according to Kant, tries to leave experience behind, tries to leave um, sense perception out of Hegel, for example, behind. Now, to forego these faculties in the search of transcendental truths is to commit oneself to sophistical illusion. Now, Kant proposes that the antinomies fundamental to metaphysical inquiry or pure reason can be rem remedied by adopting a transcendental approach that refrains from discerning what it is incapable of understanding. For example, the noumenon, God, the origin of space and time. Like we can't validate these claims. We cannot, can't um, know for sure about them. And it is instead, that is uh, the transcendental approach, it is instead concerned with the operations that make these cognitions possible and the effects that impose themselves on humans through their perceiving the world and vice versa. How um, human perception, as it is filtered through the understanding, I might be getting the order wrong, the understanding and then into, um, reason, I think, uh, then provides an ordering to the world or imparts a certain ordering upon the world. Now, in his words, the receptivity of the subject to the affected, uh, to be affected by objects necessarily precedes all intuitions of these objects. So describing um, certainly a phenomenological engagement between humans in the world, where one shapes the other and, and vice versa. Now, this is not to maintain that there are there exist objects exterior to uh, human perception that have a kind of ontological uniformity separate from human perception, as I as I implied that these objects, as they exist for uh, humans, comply to our faculties of understanding, at least as we have imposed that upon them. And it is instead to confirm that objects only exist in and through human perception. 
Now, by showing us this or by giving us this, Kant lays the foundation for his groundbreaking theory of transcendental idealism, the idea that all objects of an experience possible for us are nothing but appearances. In his words, of course, mere representations, which as they are represented as extended beings or series of alterations have outside our thoughts no existence grounded in itself. There is thus no way to certainly say anything about the world without making direct reference to the apparatuses of perception that constitute that world. Now, it is in the interest of, to return to conspiracy theories once again, it is in the interest of conspirators to keep their actions secret, and so many conspiracies have likely occurred without anyone's knowing it. Their secrecy allows them to elude identification, and it might also encourage people to be hypervigilant against conspiracies uh, with conspiracy theories, whether or not they have any access to the so-called truth of the conspiracy. And the conspiracy theory nevertheless holds sway over both the conspiracy theorists and, a and potential conspirators. We might think about Pizzagate here. So a transcendental approach to conspiracy theories engage them on the basis of the effects they produce as phenomenal, phenomenal narratives it can be engaged with in terms of the, their effects. So we are all aware, for example, of the 9-11 conspiracy, of 9-11 conspiracy theories, but we can't verify the claims made by the conspiracy about, uh, conspiracy theory about the um, conspiracy it describes. So some guiding questions that would motivate this approach might be, for example, whether or not certain conspiracy theories produce certain responses. For example, uh, do conspiracy theories directed against marginalized people like in the case of Jewish people, for example, or, or many other different groups, elicit different effects than other conspiracy theories. And this would be to engage them, you know, whether or not they are true, uh, to, in terms of how they are engaged with, how they are deployed, against whom they are deployed, and so on. Uh, another question might be how have conspiracy theories contributed to shaping society and therefore human perception and understanding. Now, it's in the nature of the conspiracy theory, because um, as an myself being very much motivated by Bradditch's thought, um, recognizing that the conspiracy theory is a term that is always being contested in how it is deployed, how it is chastised, how it is might not exist at all, really. It is just the, um, created as a kind of what he calls a conspiracy panic. I'm interested in the ways that, uh, I'm also interested in the ways, that, or what about the conspiracy theory remains consistent across different conspiracy theories. And there are some guiding, um, there are some guiding axioms of the conspiracy theory. It must describe um, an event or phenomenon that includes two or more people, perhaps working in secret to undermine uh, somebody else or another group to disenfranchise another group for their own benefit, be it economical, economic, political, and so on. Now it's in that very, um, that element of conspiracy theories that opens up a certain possibility for reactions. And I, I entertain briefly the idea of going into a, um, going into a part discussing the origins of, uh, of human civilization and coming out of, for example, coming out of um, a, a cooling period in, on earth when crops were growing up everywhere and suddenly people were like, before they even had agriculture, were saying things, perhaps saying things like, well, it would be really bad if there are people on the horizon, uh, those conspirators that we don't know are there, uh, were to come and take our stuff. So we better put up some walls to make sure that that doesn't happen, um, which relates to, I believe it's James Scott's idea. Uh, I think it's called Against the Grain. Anyways, the, the anthropological idea that walls came before agriculture. So people were scared of conspiring foes before um, these foes could be verified or, or proved to be uh, there. And this is also adduced by the fact that many of these early, um, these early walls or these early state formations, th their walls are undamaged by battle, signaling that the reason that they were erected, these walls were erected, was likely because of an inexistent threat. But that doesn't mean that the belief in this threat in the form of a conspiracy theory uh, didn't have some effect, didn't, didn't produce um, certain outcomes. And it is in the nature of the conspiracy theory to want to perhaps amplify the intensity of the conspirators to, uh, as we heard briefly in the last uh, presentation and in the question too, 
there's kind of, in the question section too, there is a desire to make the conspirators out to have kind of supernatural power. And what that does is less, I think, in part to bolster the conspirators as it does to motivate a stronger defense against those um, conspirators, which motivates um, then stronger group solidarity against this uh, potentially threatening other. And we see examples, examples of this as well in Plato, when Plato is describing, for example, the um, Amazonian women who are always on the horizon, potentially going to invade, uh, invade Greece. And he uses this as a, as a way by which to justify Greek women entering the army to say that, hey, uh, if these Amazonian women can do it, why can't you know, our women be part of the military, essentially using this conspiracy theory of Amazonian women to justify that they themselves should intensify their defenses and become themselves eventually probably the target of a conspiracy theory that they are get growing too strong and they're going to threaten nearby regions and and so on. So those are a couple of uh, questions that might motivate or encourage a view of conspiracy theories in themselves. What you know what they do rather than whether or not they're true. Another one might be. Um, how does belief in conspiracy theories intensify or recede depending on who communicates them or depending on which medium they might be disseminated. Uh, and I'm also influenced, at least to say briefly about my own work, um, I'm interested in developing an, an intersectional approach to conspiracy theory research that engages them not just as a, a homogenous category, but instead looking at the varying histories that uh, perhaps lend a certain credence to belief in conspiracy theories and what they do, what they do, how they perform different functions, depending on the different communities that use them and how they are chastised or approached differently, depending on the communities that, um, that use them. And I draw upon different examples. Of course, I say that Alex Jones's conspiracy theories are different than, for example, Spike Lee, uh, who's on the record saying that AIDS is designed in a lab to depopulate um, Black people in the United States and, and, and all across the globe, um, drawing these distinctions between them on the basis not of saying like one is more empirically true than the other, but rather that they exist differently within a certain economy of, of, uh, of meaning. Uh, and yeah, and these are just some essentially some notes towards this possible approach and what that might look like. And I thank you for entertaining me here. Sorry, I forgot to unmic myself there. Thank you for that, David, very interesting talk. It's been a been almost actually slightly more than 20 years since I've done any work on Kant and I was always much more of a Hegel person than a Kantian truth be told so there's a certain amount of having to dredge up memories of of Kantian ph philosophy as we wait for people to put their questions into the Q&A so I suppose my my big question here is what size conspiracy theories are, are we looking at here? Because if we're concerned that from appearances, we can't grasp, say, the truth of a conspiracy theory, we've only got the appearance of the thing. That's, that might apply to things like the kind of the Alex Jonesian or David Ikean vast conspiracy theories. But if you, have, you have, if you have a definition of a conspiracy theory that also includes things like surprise birthday parties, political coups being examples of conspiracy theories, you might go, well, actually, the appearance gives you everything you need to know. The conspiracy theory is pretty, pretty obvious as to what it is. There, there, are, no, there are no mysteries going on there. Yeah, I think that I think that that's a very good point. Um, and to to avoid going into an entire exposition into my view of the definition of the conspiracy theory, uh, what I just briefly alluded to in terms of, or what are some axioms or qualities that remain consistent about them, and that you you describe in your book, of course, uh, like the, you gave the example of the birthday party, um, implying two or more people working in secret to realize some end that someone becomes privy to and suggests that this this occurs. 
so in that way, I'm interested primarily in the mostly like the global conspiracy theories. And I forget whose term that is uh, the like superpower conspiracy theories. Oh, yeah, that's the that's the kind of Bakunian taxonomy. Exactly. Tax yeah, taxonomy between event systemic and su and su super conspiracies, which then Riker talked about with total and global conspiracies. Yeah, yeah. So the ones that lend themselves to a certain political or academic ire, like the like, and this is again, I'm drawing from Bradditch, like how certain ideas like people uh, like if someone describes in the case of like a birthday party describes this conspiracy of people organizing a birthday, whether or not that's going to be considered a conspiracy theory, you know, I don't know in that moment. Uh, but looking at the ways in which conspiracy theories, depending on how they are constructed or approached, will give them their identity as conspiracy theories or give them that that quality within a certain um, within a certain framework of discursive power relations and then attain once they've attained that status i'm interested in uh, stepping in there and asking how they how they differ how they perform different functions how they whether or not they're true uh, that is yes i guess i suppose as the as the arch particularist i think I think it's a case of you can do both. I think you can engage in a kind of veristic investigation into these things and also look at what kind of functional role it might be playing regardless of its truth. So you might well go, well, there are these large conspiracy theories out there and it actually doesn't really matter whether they're true or false. What actually really matters is, is what kind of social cachet comes from cashing in on the conspiracy theory and indeed that gets you into the kind of interesting discussion of you know does Alex Jones really believe all the conspiracy theories that he pronounces because I mean logistically he can't because some of them contradict other ones and not in a way that something he said six months ago contradicts something he's saying now sometimes it's something he said five minutes ago contradicts what he's saying now and so you can go well the, the function Functional role is completely separate from the veristic one. But at the same time, I can kind of see that sometimes you don't really care about the veristic aspect of a conspiracy theory. You actually just care about what role is it playing at this point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is part of a, so you're saying this, this is part of a, a larger project that you're engaging in which is obviously spun out of the phd but not ended up being in the phd yes so i was i was interested in doing like a history of conspiracy theory research looking at uh early state formations and certain uh hypothesizing this the, the way that conspiracy theories may have motive motivated these early state formations to erupt uh essentially giving us setting the foundation for what we know to be civilization um motivating walls essentially uh, and that was going to be a way by which to engage conspiracy theories in their effective potential, what they can do, and that using that as a basis to take them seriously uh, and to really um, engage with them in that way. And that has mutated into a much more precise, thank, thanks to my supervisor, my supervisors, uh, a much more precise analysis of um, how conspiracy theories are different depending on the different communities that use them and how they are uh, going to be uh, approached differently and understood differently. And one of the people that I draw upon is an upcoming um, kind of uh, academic, um, just a, a new, just assistant professor, I think, at the University of Toronto. Her name is Nicole Charles, and she does research into uh, she doesn't describe this as a conspiracy theory, but she uses the, the rhetoric of suspicion in uh, the Bahamas about, or sorry, um, Barbados, sorry, uh, talking about Barbadian women's suspicion of vaccines and how she describes, uh, describes the suspicion as uh, motivated by certain histories of biomedical oppression of Black people in the Barbados uh, and using that as like, an empirical truth to justify belief in what might not be like empirically true, that is a desire to depopulate black people in Barbados. Um, so finding a kind of meeting point exactly as you described between the historical truth that motivates this belief, but at the same time, 
recognizing that there are elements of it that aren't true, that don't undermine uh, the narrative itself, that you know might point to different truths that uh, about ongoing oppression of uh, Barbadian women, for example, as just one. Uh, that's yeah, that's my approach or motive. Those are my motivations for my approach. But actually, that means you probably would be in the same way I recommended this to Thomas in the last session. You might be interested in the work on ancient Athenian and Roman conspiracy narratives, because that very much is along the lines of what we can't do is say that good, virtuous Roman men do bad things. What we can say is that women, slaves, and foreigners can induce good, virtuous Roman men in moments of weakness to do things which lead to the downfall of the Republic. So it's a, it's a way of putting into a political narrative, men aren't to blame, it's outside forces which can affect men using their witchy wiles. And uh, so Victoria Emma Pagan points out that there are a lot of witch slaves, women who have these witchy powers, and it's used as a mechanism for basically explaining away why men do the bad things that they do. Yeah, and I, I had written uh, a little bit about Sallust and, and Catiline's conspiracy. Um, ah yes yeah because that 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 logic is used and there is a complete it's just interesting because we hear a lot now and i'm thinking of rosenblum and weirhead um we hear a lot now about how there's like we've we've uh dropped or we've just departed from using evidence and reason we just use insistence to prove a conspiracy and they use this to describe a transformation of conspiracy theories into conspiracism and just looking at all these previous examples, like in the case of Salas conspiracy theory um, of, uh, of Catiline, what you see there is exactly the same thing. You just see efforts to uh, slander uh, Catiline in almost every way, shape and form very openly without having any evidence, saying things like uh, how he's essentially um, like a devil worshiping uh, person trying to trying to uh, sort of bend the pliable minds of the young getting them to drink blood like things like that like essentially uh 80s um uh, you know um uh, kind of witchcraft scare in the in the united states and it just goes to show that there's that a very long history of that um of these efforts to use conspiracy theories to kind of target marginalized groups of course to target people who are seen as being unsavory to a fragile nation uh, or what they perceive to be fragile and using that to strengthen and intensify the social bonds within that within that setting within that nation yeah so rather than a satanic panic in the roman sense it's a saturnine pa panic right. uh, curtis right. has a question for controversial conspiracy theories what are they able to do well sorry what they are able to do may depend in part on how likely to be true they seem to be thoughts um yeah and i think that this comes down to i it's a quote from somewhere and i, I don't remember where but that in order for mis misinformation to be effective it needs to be like 95 percent true or something um and i think that there is a lot of uh it does help when it can be uh it does look to be true now for it to look to be true demands an interrogation of what evidence can look like and i think that this can often go down cultural lines so for example in the case of like anti-semitic conspiracy theories just by saying that jewish people are working as a world conspiracy even though there's no evidence for that because there is also there's already this cultural belief that that is true then lends it a kind of credence by virtue of its uh inert uh existence within that cultural paradigm and so i all I'm saying is that I agree, but it also demands an interrogation of what can be used as evidence and what is acknowledged and recognized as legitimate evidence of a conspiracy and how it isn't always like empirical, so to speak. It can it can go down cultural or political lines.